Checking in with State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy for a Tacky Talk coming on the morning after the Governor's State of the Commonwealth Address. Hey, Tacky. Hey, Joe. Good afternoon on the uh, January 18th, 2024. We're still making our way through the year. Yeah, we're halfway through uh, January, even more so, and uh, it's starting to feel like it finally. <laughs> Well, uh, thankfully, there was not too much snow, but I do understand there was some flooding going on uh, this past uh, weekend in um, the peninsulas. I heard uh, Swan in particular got uh, uh, flooded out, but you know, the regular so-called regular parts of Seed Street, they normally see flooding. Also got some heavy water and you know, also out in the neck, um, Spring Street and Rockland Street, and I had the same problem it had in 2018, but you know, obviously there's no ice a dam situation this time. We had ice floating into the um, the underpass of that small bridge into the marsh and just clogging everything up. So uh, we actually weathered the storm pretty well, despite the fact that the majority of the storm came in uh, at the end of low tide as the tide was coming up to rise. Um, not good, but, you know, everyone remembers 2018, we had two in a row, really bad uh snowstorm and then we had like this special northeaster a couple months later so um you know overall uh, i think we weathered well and unfortunately i think there'd be a few more of these way things are looking yeah unfortunately we didn't have to write we didn't have need high water vehicles to rescue people from the homes this time um you know that 2018 was just so devastating do, do you think the seawall work has has helped oh absolutely i mean the city has made major investments. You know, I got a little bit of bond money. There's a little bit of Fed money. There's a little bit of state cash money. I mean, there's, you know, plus the city's own uh, bond monies, uh, you know, a lot of cobbling together of money from the state, federal, and local level for the, for the seawalls. Um, and uh, it's an ongoing project. I think everyone realizes you just don't put one up overnight. There's a lot of conditions and obviously you want to have them to last a long time. So, you know, they, they're, they're going to settle like any other large um foundation sub as foundation object so uh i know uh, we know that this will be a continuing ongoing issue uh coastal defense is a priority of mine um that's really under talked about as part of climate change people like to talk about climate change but no one talks about coastal defense you know natural seed uh, sand dunes natural uh, sea grass uh, a lot of the stuff that's been washed away and of course you know walson beach is not a, a natural beach it's an artificial beach and you know, uh, dredging is an important part of it too, not necessarily just for boat access, but also flushes a fairly shallow bay. Uh, shallow bay. So when the tide goes out, you want to make sure the water gets out fast and takes any of the uh, material out there to see naturally. Um, so you know, a lot of good work by you know, obviously DPW, you know, the mayor's office, you know, the city council, you know, they did a good job on addressing the storm as well as emergency management and fire and police and everyone else. So. The city has a great team together, you know, in emergency situations. And you know, obviously the state delegation working with the city and the federal delegation will continue to try to find funding uh, for coastal defenses. And actually will be a subject of my conversation with the DCR commissioner, which I'm working towards a meeting, hopefully by the end of this month. Speaking of uh, C Street, um, any update on how that reconstruction project's going? Uh, the, bid, the bids are out. So we probably won't get word about who the winning bid is probably for another month or so. Um, Department of Transportation will update us as well as the city uh, DPW will update us once we get to that part. You know, we're hoping construction will begin uh, at a preliminary level by spring, early summer, and then it's uh, full steam ahead. And uh, hopefully for a quiet winter next winter, then we'll probably shave off uh, several weeks if, if it's a quiet winter next winter. Obviously if the winter is severe and terrible, uh, it's going to get delayed uh, in the winter months. So uh, the project, you know, on the outside, we're hoping not more than 18 months, you know, 24 months. Um, if it's really bad weather, you know, it could extend up to 30 months, depending on the, the weather situation. So, you know, obviously we're looking for under two years if possible to get this done, but you never know until you get this project started. Again, I'm very confident we'll get a lot of unhappy calls as well as Senator Keenan. Um, from the residents uh, along C Street in the Marymount and Adam Shore area um, regarding the impact on traffic. But, you know, again, remind folks, you know, pre-COVID, you know, we had people die um, in crosswalks on C Street. I'm aware that it is a very quickly, uh, you realize you're doing, you know, 45, 50 before you know it, uh, when you have an open path. And, 
It's not always a clean view through the entire part of Street Street. It's not a straight line, clean, clear view. So there are curves and bends. Um, and you got traffic uh, trying to get you know, on and off both sides of the street. It's two way. Plus you have the traffic from the hockey rink that you know needs to be mitigated. And part of it includes a, a traffic light synced to the other lights at the hockey rink. So you know, this is a pretty important project. It's a big project, it's a $10 million project. And the state is paying for this project. It is not a city but a project. The city will control the road, own the road, and all own all the improvements that the state pays for it. So this is a substantial a state improvement. And it's you know obviously in my district, it's it's one of the larger projects of a of single single funding. Yeah, so there's a lot going on there. You've got uh, the you know the new police station project. The DPW is right there. The U.S. Naval Training Center is right there. It's a very busy, busy, active area. Yeah, and the first stage was obviously the improvement of the intersection uh, with the traffic lights and commercial drive and C Street. You know, I got that money um, in a bond fund you know, very early in my career, actually. Um, you know, a dozen years ago, and you know, obviously it took a year and a half to get the money released, and then you had to go through the design planning, and there was an eminent domain. The city was very good working with the state on that uh, together, um, and uh, you know that's why you have that right hand uh, lane access. Um, again, a great cooperation between the state and the city on putting that together, and this is just a natural, uh, logical part of the next phase of that regarding overall safety improvements from Palm Street to the uh, uh, Quinshaw Drive uh, intersection. Obviously, we don't have to rebuild the intersection. It's done. Um, the fact that lights, you know, are modernized there actually will help a lot of on this construction and sinking because if you're coming out of the neck, uh, you actually don't see a functional traffic light that isn't, isn't a pedestrian light until you get to the Palmer Street intersection. So having a new lighting system, you know, at Queen Shore and C Street, you know, is really good because it gives the ability to already advance sink all the way down to, to Palmer. Right. Yeah, it's already helped a lot with the queuing, you know, trying to get on to Quincy Shore Drive. Yeah, absolutely. I know, you know, Quincy Shore Drive uh, is nature of the 3A um, access point to people coming in from, from Hingham and Weymouth going over that side to try to get to the expressway. Um, and, you know, I've been working to try to make sure that DCR, you know, is aware of the school crossing on Quincy Shore Drive regarding um, kids crossing over there and the cross rocks are properly painted uh, so that's been something, you know, I've been dealing with for the last year or so. Um, and, you know, I need to, you know, again, express these priorities to the, to the DCR commissioner about, about these locales. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's better than it was um, a dozen plus years ago. Uh, and hopefully you know, these new traffic improvements will slow down traffic. Um, there'll be some beautification as part of it. A bike lane is part of it. Uh, so hopefully, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be better in the long term. And, you know, it's C Street's actually a fairly, that section of C Street's fairly um, not flooding as much. Mm -hmm. That's not the best way to say those words, but, you know, that's part of it. Um, and even though it's heavily traveled, you know, it's not a straight line. There are curves and there's bit bumps, but, you know, it, it should be a much smoother and it'll probably be um, a better, um, you know, a better, um, smoother, longer with this improvement uh, pending, of course, any kind of road work associated with, you know, water pipes or gas mains and whatnot, which the city, as we continue to settle, as I say, was still selling from the 2010 storms. Mm -hmm. The whole city is still selling again because of the change of water table. Right. Yeah. I know that's, that's why they're putting the new uh, police station way up high um, to, to, you know, accommodate the, the new uh, flooding potential. Well, uh, people kind of forget sometimes. We're actually surrounded by two rivers and two, and we have two brooks running through it. So you got deposit on the north, you got town, uh, uh, Fall River on the south, and and down the middle you have Furnish Brook and you have Town Brook. So the city really has two major waterways plus two smaller waterways, and the two smaller waterways is really flood control. Uh, they mm -hmm. use those two waterways as drainage to to Quincy Bay or Town uh, Brook Marsh, and then you know obviously people know I live. Uh, with um, the um, Black's Creek uh, 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 Basin um, Preserve in front of my house. I'm looking at the same marsh my entire life. So like I said, I'm not a marsh expert, but you stare at it long enough, you learn a thing or two. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, the cities, you know, need to maintain these open spaces for water retention is critical. It's 
obviously important to the environment. Again, I love the fact that egrets have been a regular occurrence back in my neighborhood, uh, but also uh, for flood control. And as the city continues to do its development, um, you know, this is something that's a big part regarding proper drainage because water always finds the lowest point and uh, you can't stop it once it starts. And uh, as you may remember, Town Brook was moved twice as part of the mm -hmm. project. The city had to move Town Brook twice and some of the older buildings, which are probably going to be gone in another year. If we look into basements, you can actually see Town Brook. Yes, that's right. There's wooden culverts, actually, it's underneath some of those old buildings. <laughs> yeah, and the uh, wood petrifies. So as long yep. as the wood stays submerged, uh, actually wooden culverts are just fine. <laughs> Amazing as that says, you, you all think it would rot, but, you know, wood consistently underwater is petrified. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so as I mentioned, we're recording this uh, the morning after uh, the governor's state of the Commonwealth speech. You were there in the House chambers, I know. What did you think? Well, uh, governor's first uh, state of the Commonwealth uh, speech. And, um, you know, she did a little victory lap, which is great. The legislature has been busy this past year, and the governor has been implementing policies from the prior uh, session, as well as obviously in this kind of post-nuke sort of weird COVID world, because um, it's not gone. It's just that we moved to a different phase of our lives. And uh, talked about some uh, major tragedies that are, are being addressed that, uh, you know, was from the prior administration, including the situation, the tragedy of the Holyoke Soldiers Home in particular. Uh, and our former colleague, uh, John Santiago, is the Secretary of uh, Veterans Affairs, who uh, is military and a emergency room doctor until he took this job at BMC. So he's very aware of the impact of COVID on an upfront and personal level uh, as a professional. And, uh, you know, I talked about uh, other achievements regarding getting money to senior towns and Chapter 90 road work and, you know, the fact that we got universal school breakfast lunches, universal meals implemented, and, you know, the and the uh, Chapter 70 fundies implemented um, as well, the new Chapter 70 education money uh, that uh, was the first change in education funding for city towns from the state uh, in, uh, since, what, 92, something like that. It was before my time uh, in the state house. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of good things to talk about. Um, so that's kind of how the first part works. The second part is, you know, the wish list. Yes, uh, with the big price tag mostly on the, uh, actually there's a hearing today, you know, on the Affordable Housing Act, I guess, $4 billion. Yeah, uh, well, uh, remind folks, you know, this is bond, op or bond appropriations. So under the Constitution, the legislature can authorize bonding, but the governor and the treasurer working together, uh, you know, uh, util can utilize the bond, can, can issue bonds. And obviously the treasurer's job is to issue bonds you know, with the best rate possible, which we're in a higher rate interest rate environment, which is a little more challenging, of course, at this time to time these bond issuances. So, uh, but, you know, we authorize the government to do this and we have a self-imposed bond cap of over $2 billion now. I, again, I need to get these new numbers because it's not, it's always a moving target with CPI uh, calculations. Uh, but we know there is a self-imposed bond cap that she's going to continue to most likely maintain because our bond ratings are the highest level it's ever been since the 80s. Mm. Uh, no one wants to put the bond rating at risk. So, you know, she has that. She has the economic development bond bill uh, coming apart at some point as part of a larger economic development proposal. And there's going to be an information technology bond bill as well that's going to be coming along. It's time for the state to upgrade its technology. I think the last big upgrade, I think it was seven years ago in terms of like, I think we authorized a bond almost 10 years ago, but it took them three years before the, the state, you know, the administration had a plan of how to use said bond money. And I think it's about seven, eight years ago since they had the last big one. Um, and we're probably going to get a cap, we might, probably might maybe get a capital improvement project bond. But, you know, that could happen next legislative session. It doesn't have to happen this legislative session um, to do a capital, another capital bond, because I think that that's what's paying for the new Quincy Courthouse. Um, and uh, eventually that authorization will go past. So the state authorized the governor to issue bonds, pretty much 5, 10, 20, 30 years, depending on the circumstances. And once that authorization's in place, you know, the governor can access that unless the governor, unless legislature takes away that authorization. And, 
you know, stuff that's in the works, um, you know, we'll, we'll do a, what we call prior authorization continued, right? Carry it over. So you got you know, a bond project that starts at the end of an authorization. You know, well, obviously we're not going to stop the funding after the authorization. We're going to, you know, reauthorize that um, in a project that's active. So, I mean, there's a lot of these like little moving parts. It's a bigger state than people realize regarding capital projects. And, you know, we have to work with the governor's offices. Um, the different secretariats have different projects and uh, figure out, you know, what's in the works and what's going to authorize expire and what do we have to take action on as we kind of discuss this bond. So the big one, she, again, she talked about this $4 billion housing bond she's testifying on it today. Um, as part of her uh, ideas on how to push forward on addressing the housing crisis and affordability crisis. And honestly, I'm not entirely clear what the proposal is yet. It, well, it, because she didn't really explain it <laughs> in detail, actually. <laughs> yeah, part of a state comment with address is that you don't have time to get to minutia. Yeah. So, uh, again, you want to keep this thing in an hour. We ran about an hour 15 if you're watching at home, this address or YouTube or the state website. Um, and uh, you only can get over the broad brushes, and we understand that. Um, but some stuff you kind of like think you may sort of kind of understand what's going on, but you know, and you guys all know, like, and you do this long enough, you kind of intuitively understand what she's saying, but some stuff I'm still waiting for details because I'm not sure exactly what's going on. Right, yeah. And it's just, as you've, have you said many times before, the governor can propose all they want, but but it's up to the legislature to make it happen. That's actually true. Uh, you know, the, the funding has to come through us in the Constitution. Uh, and also a bond authorization has to come through us. Um, and again, but again, a bond authorizations, again, the governor's office is very conscientious. And every governor since uh, Bill Well has been very conscientious about the bond rating. We cannot put our bond rating at risk. So mm. they can talk about borrowing as much as they want. Uh, but we're not the feds. We can't have a suspend. Right. Uh, and uh, you got to be very careful how you do it. So, you know, some of this stuff is, you know, cash. For example, she wants to do universal literacy. She wants to buy all these new books. I'm not an expert in education. I don't know what book she's talking about. Um, the state's literacy rate's actually pretty high. We're in, we're in the low 90%. Low 90, low 90 mm -hmm. So that's pretty good. I mean, 10%, give or take um, a few percentage points, you know, is a literacy. Mm -hmm. But we could do better. I agree with that. We should be closer to a hundred percent literacy rate um, for all residents. And this is a, this is a state of immigrants. People always forget this sometimes, and they're always new immigrants. And as much as we talk about the migrant issue, uh, there is a lot of uh, immigrants here who do not speak English as first language and living in Quincy. You know, somewhere about twenty five percent to thirty percent of the population does not speak English as first language. Right. Yeah. One thing I thought would impact Quincy is she talked about the um, the gateway cities uh, uh, getting uh, being expanded actually to include all gateway cities, including Quincy, for affordable childcare, make it more accessible. Yeah, we all agree on this. Uh, affordable childcare is very important. We you know, did uh, this uh, well now last year. You know the tax package that included expanding the uh, tax credit. We basically doubled the tax credit on dependents. Uh, which include children and you know, taking a mom and dad at home or other uh, loved ones uh, as your primary caretaker. We expanded that tax credit, which provides some assistance. Um, you know, obviously, uh, there's tax credits is the normal way we do this <laughs> um, regarding uh, anything involving taking being a caretaker or, or caring for dependents. Um, we'll see what she has for a proposal in terms of actual details. Uh, right. We do have uh, basically two, three kinds of child care services. We have uh, low, moderate income child care services. South Shore Stars is the example of that on the South Shore. Um, that's an important uh, program for uh, low, uh, moderate, and really low uh, income folks to have uh, child care. That is packed at capacity. And there are not some places the governor should really focus on expanding capacity, not just um, on uh, reimbursement rates, but also you know, capital improvements to find and help pay for uh, expanded structures uh, because the demand is high. Uh, and it's not just about paying for a child care for families. It's do we have enough physical space for child care as right. well? And these yeah. not-for-profits that are 
contracted the state, you know, face two things. They face not just a funding issue, but they also face a capital improvement issue. Um, secondly, you have uh, like uh, Horizons, Bright Horizons, what is called, or I can't remember right now, but you know, right. yep. the for-profit uh, health daycare services, uh, which almost went under during COVID, as you may remember. That they went to bankruptcy, I think, for a short period. Um, and, uh, you know, where does that fit in? Do, do you subsidize for-profit companies or do you provide uh, vouchers or something for parents and families or is it strictly a tax credit issue? And then lastly, we have small businesses, right? You know, uh, Kid Connection um, is an example of that. You have that, you know, people who are running um, services out of their homes, obviously they're very highly regulated by the state. Uh, you know, how do you uh, manage those small business owners as well? So you got the big corporate, the small business owners, and specific not-for-profits contracted the state. And, of course, we've got Head Start, which, you know, was made. It didn't make as much papers as it should, but, I mean, she was slow in releasing Head Start money uh, from the budget, which a lot of people are still scratching their head about. Well, it's not child care services. It is what it sounds like. It's, it's kind of essentially pre-K, which she did talk about uh, in her speech. Um, you know, that's another re important resources, you know, for low and moderate and low income folks uh, to um, give a shot at kids to, to get ahead that, you know, would no, are actually under resourced regarding education. So, you know, there's a lot, as you can tell, there's a lot of different um, forms of child care and, and those type of services down here. And, um, you know, you can tell I'm kind of aware of them all. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that big Head Start program right in Quincy Point, the old St. Joseph School. Mm -hmm. The uh, the Rosemary Warburg. Right. Yeah, exactly. And all, and all these things she's talking about, she didn't talk a lot about, you know, the fact that revenue projections uh, are not meeting expectations and uh, there have been some cuts recently. State of Commonwealth is not about talking about bad things. We, <laughs> we're not coming out with a downer, folks. I mean, when was the last time you came out of a, a dress without a, a positive uplift, right? I mean, you know, it's, I've never heard one governor in my 28 years of watching State of the Commonwealth with one governor just leaving us on a massive downer. It's not like tacky talk. Well, more than happy to leave you on a downer by the time. <laughs> hey, I don't remember Jimmy Carter's malaise speech. Do you remember that? <laughs> I'm a little young for Jimmy Carter. Yeah, all right. Uh, I'm uh, <laughs> showing my age here. <laughs> We're showing your age. Uh, we'll, we'll get to mine on a different day. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, this, all right. So it's all, all uh, rainbows and unicorns in the state of the Commonwealth. <laughs> I wouldn't put it that far into fairy tale, uh, but you know it is a wish list. So, well, right, yeah. But even even the budget proposal is a wish list, right, from the governor that she'll put that out next week. Well, yeah, I mean, universal pre K will be very interesting to discuss, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, getting your kids in pre K at age four is what she's she's proposing, right. Uh, obviously, the legislature isn't a closed door. We do consider all ideas, and you know, we did pilot the community college uh, tuition um, assistance uh, for uh, persons uh, 25 and older um, that meet certain income qualifications and, you know, demonstrates they can actually complete the program. You provide you know, free tuition for that select group. And uh, it's again, I when this program came out, you know, we put a pilot out and uh, we'll see what the results of it is successful. And, you know, there's a high graduation rate and people who uh, are able to advance in their careers and lives uh, through it, the legislature is likely to continue the project. But mm. this isn't just like an overnight instant results. We do have to right. uh, wait it out to see what the outcomes are. So, um, you know, again, we're not a closed door. We, we all, you know, we did raise our eyebrows a little bit about some how we're going to pay for this stuff. Um, you know, as you saw those 9C cuts, as you mentioned earlier, and it's a sign that the economy is slowing, but it's, again, a very weird slowdown. It's not like any other thing we've seen in our lifetimes. Because look at unemployment. It's so low, right? Yeah, under 4% unemployment, wages are up, but cost of living is up. And right. um, some people are doing two jobs uh, despite uh, increased wages. Uh, and uh, this is naturally incurring wages. It's not government-induced. This is not a minimum wage law. This is just market forces. This is capitalism mm -hmm. uh, that's driving businesses that need to compete for workers, which is good for workers. Uh, those may not remember. The last time we saw this was the dot-com boom mm -hmm. back in the late 90s to early 2000s, really like 99 to 2001. 
you know, where um, we had a three year period ish, give or take, where workers coming into the workforce basically command top dollar because of a shortage. So it does happen. It's just very uh, far and few between. Um, so it is a it's it's going to be very strange, right? And you know, I do expect people's uh, spending will go down on things like luxury goods and you know basically anything of a sales tax is probably likely to, to to take a hit. And again, I said before, and I'll say again that the restaurant industry is probably going to see another hit. Um, this time, not because of external forces associated with the disease, but it's going to be because people need to make prioritization um, when they look at the receipts on their bills. So, you all, we're already seeing it at the local level, even, um, you know, some of the Quincy Center restaurants are uh, either closing or downsizing, limiting hours. So, it's, it's happening for sure, even some of the chains. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, everyone's aware of the fat cat at this point. Um, you know, obviously, I do work in downtown. Uh, and uh, most of the nicer restaurants still are not open for lunch. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fridays only at some of the nicer restaurants, some still not at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, keep an eye on your receipts, folks. I mean, there's these new service fees that are coming on to your bill. Uh, I won't name the restaurant because I actually have to go visit there because I do eat there. But, you know, I found a 20% service fee, a not a gratuity service fee. I was a little surprised by the wording. Um, and generally disclose a gratuity uh, add ons your bill, like up front and center somewhere in a menu. And clearly, I've been eating there so long, I've not paid attention to um, any changes in the menu. So I have to read them more closely next time. But I've heard things like kitchen fees appearing. That it's like, you're, you know, yeah, it, this is a curious industry of restaurants, unlike retail. They will not put in their entire infrastructure into the cost of their menu. It's very interesting. Uh, retail can't do that. They can't just charge you a service fee at you know checkout. Uh, they, can, uh, they 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 have to uh, include the entire cost of service of of doing business inside the retail product. Restaurants yeah, you see a price for a shirt at a store. That's the price for that shirt. Right? Yeah, and it includes the price of electricity, insurance, wages, um, rent. Um, right. You know any. All costs associated with doing business is part of that shirt that you bought. Uh, when you buy a meal, part of the whole cost of doing business should be wrapped in the meal. Then you see these additional service charges and you scratch your head about this because shouldn't that be part of the whole meal cost? And this is my conversation with restaurant industries, which is a kind of fascinating conversations that refuse to increase the prices, but they're going to hit you in another way. I, I just... Is that legal? Yeah, it's nothing illegal about putting a service charge. Um they should disclose disclosure better. Yeah, uh, but I, well, mean, I guess it, it makes the makes the cost of the meal look artificially low until you go to pay for it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just speaking off the top of my head, as we always do here. I mean, it's like the airline industry, right? We're in that kind of nickel and dime spot where the price you see for airline ticket, whether it be using bookings or Expedia or any number of travel sites, that you know doesn't include taxes and fees and doesn't always disclose whether or not you probably get a bag. At least you know now in Expedia and the websites for airlines that now we're doing a better job of saying that you know this is the price. You know, you don't get to pick a seat. You do get to pick a seat. Yeah. You know, change fees, no change fees. Can yeah. you have a carry on? Can you not have a carry on? And then you know that this price is not the end price, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So they're doing a better job online for, for them to properly disclose your tier options uh, because there's additional fees or there's a different price for additional, uh, uh, I don't even know what to call it, additional seating, whatever you want to call it. The, Amenities, I have no idea. Whatever. It's called just a way to make more money. <laughs> yeah, it is in the end. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, it kind of reminds me a little bit of that about, you know, how airlines at one time was like, oh, here's a $100 ticket, but we didn't tell you have to pay $20 for a bag. Oh, by the way, we didn't tell you just, you know, you got to pick your seat for like five extra dollars when it can, you can pick your seat or whatever, right? Right, you, right. If you want a seat belt, that's going to be extra. <laughs> yeah, essentially, yes. So, you know, it's something you don't see until you get the checkout. Yeah. The difference, of course, that, you know, on airlines, you can always say cancel. Once you're in the restaurant, the bill shows up. You're kind of in an awkward position. Well, yeah, if you ate the food, then <laughs> you owe it, yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of like you got to fight a bill. It's, it's wicked awkward. Yeah, yeah. So... Mm -hmm.
I'm I, again, it's it's happening, and I'm not sure exactly, you know, how, where this is going to go. But I mean, you know, I've seen it done. I've heard, I talked to some friends about it. You know, they've seen it done. If they keep naming different type of bees. Um, but again, I, I think most of us listening here would just prefer that they just jam everything into the price of the menu. Uh, it's almost like weird because, like, the, the, are, do people actually shop by menu? I mean, I don't. It's not like I sit and look at the restaurant price structures online if I can find it and then pick the restaurant I want to go to. No, right. I think people shop for selection for for the food rather than the price. Yeah, yeah, that's what I always. My philosophy, you guys know I don't eat out much, but it's it's always been kind of my understanding is that you know, people eat at restaurants based on food preference and favorites. Um, and sometimes, you know, for exotic, in the sense, you're going to try something new. But I don't think people sit on the website, you know, reading menu prices. And some uh, menu prices online don't even have a price anymore. They just That's list right. new items. Yep. So it's um, because if you're like a destination restaurant, you drove there, well, you're kind of stuck. But if you're like in a restaurant dense area, you know, are you going to go in and look at the menu because they may not have a menu posted outside and then read it and then leave and go and look at the other menu, right? I mean, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very perplexed about this because restaurant consumers don't, when you go to restaurants, you don't think the same way as you're going to retail stores. Yeah. Though no, that's true. Absolutely. You're, you're, <laughs> you're going, you're hungry, you're going out to eat. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what my first instinct. Unless somebody has a different thought on that, I maybe the restaurant critic, and maybe then maybe then. But other than that, you're you're just going out to eat. Yeah, yeah. Maybe people do restaurant shop. I mean, you know, do you go to the restaurant, sit at the table, and then get the menu and walk back out again when you look at the prices? I I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you may you know be more selective when you see the price structure. I have a different problem. I have a ton of food allergies, so you know, I've had restaurants just tell me straight up that, you know, this is going to be too hard. And I'm like, cool. And I just move on to the next place. Um, uh, yeah, I'm very complicated to feed as, as some of you may be aware. Um, so, yeah, it, again, I find the whole thing perplexing, right? I mean, other industries, generally speaking, just roll everything the price of doing business. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're the initial part of why we talk about this is, again, you know, the impact in the economy and people, you know, prioritizing, you know, what they can and cannot do. I, I I do think people are going to say, you know, I'll eat at X restaurant that I know, and it's one of my favorites, which is you know, probably a lower um, lower price because it's just a different service, different foods, right? Um, uh, some folks will just not go up to eat because they're looking at their budget and it's like, okay, this we got to cut somewhere, right? Right. And you all know groceries are high. I mean, I feel the same thing too. I was talking to someone about this and – you know, buying my mom's lactate, you know, before COVID was around two dollars and seventy cents ish, seventy nine cents. You know, sometimes it's like two fifty. You know, now we're looking in the four, yeah. four dollar zones. Uh, you know, yeah. get lucky and make it at three ninety nine. But yeah, yeah, you just said something that's key. I think that that's that's very telling to why people feel the way they do before COVID. I think people are still waiting for prices to go back to where they were before COVID. And I don't think that's going to happen. I don't believe it's going to happen either. I think there might be a mild drop, but you're not going to see pre-COVID numbers. I mean, I think part of it is that we, we may not remember this uh, because it's so fleeting in our minds. And a lot of us have this really before and after COVID memory. But in the midst of COVID, uh, there was a massive price shock to everybody regarding a lot of essential foods, milk, eggs. I mean, not exotic stuff, just plain old necessity foods. Uh, wheat because of supply chain problems. Uh, you know, obviously you guys remember the meat planks were getting COVID at a shutdown places, you know, back when we didn't know what was going on. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, that resulted in food spike pricing. and But it was temporary, uh, you know, within six-ish months, once things kind of sort of people figure out how to do things in a new world, uh, you know, prices started normalizing back, not to pre-COVID levels, but, you know, much, much significantly lower. And then, you know, the last year in 2023, you know, we faced hyperinflation, uh, 22 and 23, and now going to 24. And you're right. I don't think prices are going to take a significant decrease. I think, uh, I don't, but I think, look, I don't believe there's going to be massive deflation. I mean, you know, there's probably going to be here and there price deflation. 
Um, do I think it's going to be massive wage deflation? No, I don't think it's going to be massive wage deflation. I think this part of the country in particular has a huge labor shortage mm -hmm. in all sectors. And uh, you will not see a wage deflation. You're probably going to see a continued wage acceleration, probably not at 6% per month, but you're going to still see wage competition. Um, even as businesses uh, are going to start doing some layoffs, uh, the probability is good that you're probably going to find a job in a similar sector. Maybe not yeah. every sector, but similar sectors. Yeah, yeah. Um, can we switch gears a little bit, Zach? You talk about, um, we've talked about energy on this program many times before, I know, but um, the ability to purchase uh, the electricity from alternative suppliers and some changes that are being proposed for that. Yeah, yeah well, right now, uh, since the... Uh, 99 and really implemented through the early 2000s, uh, we have a deregulated uh, energy supply. Some of you may remember that the utility company controlled both the energy and the wires. So you had a pure monopoly where when they create, they were in charge of generation or acquisition of energy and then, you know, also the wires. So your electric bill had, uh, you know, basically a wire component for lack of better term, stuff to pay for wires and the price of energy. And then, you know, we also require build subdivisions so you can see all these other numbers you kind of scratch your head about, but, you know, that was back as part of food disclosure and billing. Um, uh, and it's not really quite food disclosure. It's a little more complicated because I lived in this world in the AG's office for a while. So, you know, you have to really choose power early on. Choices were thin. So the utility continued to provide uh, the best price possible every six months in a bid to for you to what we call basic service. As time went along, the industry continued to develop, and now you have actually a lot of choices, a dozen plus choices for your uh, energy uh, supply, not your wires, to energy, uh, electricity, uh, at a fixed cost uh, pursuant to a contract. And you can shop. You can you know look at, you can find very easy electric bill with basic services, if you have a basic service or a competitive supply. And you can uh, look at other price uh, and uh, they'll offer, you know, short, like anything else, short term, lower price, and it's the regular price, or they're going to give you a bonus, you know, gift card or whatever, just like any other business. Right. And uh, it may be better or may not be better for you, but also allows you to choose things like I want to be all renewables and I'm willing mm -hmm. to pay for that. And you can do that. Or you want a mixture, you can seed their energy supply mixture, whether it be partially fossil fuels or partially renewables, or perhaps you just want plain old wind and you don't want anything else. So you, you can, you know, choose your own energy swords, you can choose your price, you, you can choose based on your preferences. So, uh, you know, Attorney General, then, you know, the Governor's Attorney General, and now also now with Attorney General Campbell, they've, this, they've decided they want to dismantle this entire program and eliminate a residential um, energy choice and only leave it to industrial commercial. And uh, to put a perception, folks, it took three years because I was here for this. Three years for Michael Morrissey and Dan Bosley, who chaired Governor Reg's committee back then, to figure out how to detangle uh, utilities from being a monopoly on energy acquisition and energy generation. And since residentials is the super majority, like 70% plus of uh, income uh, for energy and uh, utility wires, um, you know, the biggest single market uh, will be denied uh, renewable energy. I'm sorry, renewable energy or um, energy choice. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't incentivize those companies to stay strictly for industrial and commercial. Right. Uh, and uh, we have restrictions, like you don't see advertising on the news, for example. There's numerous restricting, uh, restricting advertising the public doesn't know about this opportunity because they can't advertise properly. Right. And sometimes maybe basic service, the utility acquisition every six months is the better price for you. I mean, it's like, everyone's different. I'm not, there's not a universal rule on this on energy competitiveness, but you want to give customers, you know, you an opportunity to make your own decision about what type of electricity you want how, in terms of generation, because now all electricity is the same, and, you know, how much you're willing to pay for it. And, uh, you, you know, the governor and the attorney general wants to take that away from you. Uh, you know, the position I've always taken is the fact that DPU, common public utilities, always have had ability to enforce bad actors, which they don't do, which is a problem. We have talked to the review commissioner, chair, and the prior chair, and probably got to talk to the current chair as well. And, um, you know, I would pose out there to continue residents 
to choose your electricity, but you know, increase the safeguards. You know, do a massive bond requirement to try to eliminate lower for um, fly by night scammers. You know, try to um, actually I try I want to increase the licensing fees so it basically it's self regulated. You know, and, and create a better consumer access to DPU regarding complaints. You know, let them put their licenses at risk. DPU has not revoked one license despite bad actors. You know, better disclosure. You know, when people don't speak English as a first language in particular. You know, it was preyed upon by certain energy suppliers using uh, private contractors. You know, clear disclosures. Uh, also proposed an idea of a low income uh, bid rate. So, you know, we do have a low income rate for uh, the wires, the, the distribution charge. Uh, but you know, I, the idea was flow to us that I think is done in Ohio, where we can have a bid uh, to uh, provide a, a low income energy rate. And, and that actually will help reduce the probability of predatory behavior against low income folks on energy supply. So, you know, which, which, I'm working to address some of these um, issues, but, you know, my biggest complaint is, you know, DPU not doing their job. I really have a problem with things like that mm -hmm. uh, because I know how it works. And, you know, they can complain all they want, but do your job, right? And, uh, but I, other ideas that have come up through these conversations the last five years include what I just talked about, and we have some other ones on the table as well. So... You know, I'm not inclined to take away consumers' ability to choose, but I think better informed consumers, better ability to file complaints, and you know, doing a job and kicking out bad actors at DPU, you know, make everyone better because all it takes a few bad actors to make the whole barrel look terrible. Yeah. How do you, you know, as a consumer, if you do opt to change your supplier and go with renewable or what have you, how do you know? that the electricity coming into your house is being provided by the supplier you're, you're paying for. Well, I have to disclose that. So, of course, I can't read the website off the top of my head because you just asked me. Uh, but again, one of the problems they have is they can't like put TV commercials out, right? You don't right. see a YouTube commercial. I mean, you may get a mailer, uh, but this is one of those weird restrictions we have that doesn't you know allow consumers to know because they can't advertise to you. So hence they do things like door to door, Yep. You know, back in the door to salesman's days, which I'm not wicked fond of, but, mm -hmm. you know, this is something that needs to be addressed as well, is that if we create better outlets for them to communicate in the competitive environment by advertising, they won't need to do door to door. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we kind of, yeah, as much as the governor and AG's office, you know, talk about taking away uh, consumer choice, they do nothing to address the fact that the uh, current restrictions uh, by DPU for this industry to get a message out um, is problematic. Uh, and it's true in advertising. Again, Chapter 93 of general laws you know, prevents deceptive uh, and unfair and deceptive practices on consumers and advertising uh, uh, falsely is an unfair and deceptive practice. Okay. So there are already safeguards in place for that. Mm, yes. You know, that's part of it. I mean, advertisement, whether it be a newspaper or radio or television or internet, if you're advertising a service product, you know, it's a, you know, can't have unfair to sell practice in case the product can be in the price of electricity. So, right. uh, and again, I mean, you know, there are locked contracts. I'm not going to lie to you about that. There are contracts locked in. And this is the gamble. You know, you're locked in the contract uh, for a certain period of time. And uh, maybe uh, edgy prices drop dramatically and basic service for six months also drops at that price to give them the timing of the market. And uh, we talked about this a little bit in the past. I do kind of monitor oil. It's floating in about a $70 zone, uh, give or take two or three bucks, depending on the day. And, you know, the, the Middle East situation, um, the Israeli Hamas war, you know, obviously there's a legit concern about the spillover. And those of you who are old enough remember, you know, uh, the Iranians and other folks shooting at tankers in the Red Sea. Well, we're back there again, back from when Reagan was president, right? So, um, and it, you know, it had a huge impact on the fuel and oil markets um, after the OPEC cuts in the 70s. And then you had another, you know, incident, you know, not in the Reagan administration uh, that they had to address, not dissimilar to what the uh, Biden administration is doing now. This is right. history kind of happening again. The difference is the tech, right? Nowadays, they have, uh, you know, even um, terrorist groups are somehow getting short-range missiles, not just lobbing bazookas or whatever, right? They're not floating out bomb ship 
to boat, you know, suicide boats. I mean, now they right. have drones, right? Yeah, it, it's a little disturbing. You're right. Yeah, because I mean, even during the Iraq War, you know, Saddam Hussein had old Scud missiles, Russian missiles that he was, you know, hoping that might hit something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Even these terror groups are having, uh, I want to say, the wicked accurate weapons but they're better than they were right from the old scud days we just launched them in there and hope you hit something right right uh, thankfully no ship has uh, been severely damaged to the point where it's stranded but i mean they've all taken some minor damage and also big surprise insur insurance for these vessels going through the red sea have skyrocketed sure. these are insured all these all these uh any uh vessel out there as a cargo ship and tanker has to be insured before they go out. You can't port if you're not insured. Makes perfect sense, yeah. And we're going to pay for that eventually. It's going to right. get passed down. Uh, and, you know, global, not just Mass not, not just here in Massachusetts or the United States, globally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's going to get passed down to all destination locations. So it doesn't matter uh, what country. Nobody is um, shielded from the impact of the Red Sea situation. And of course, if you go down to the Cape of, is it Cape of Good Hope? Is that the one? Uh, uh, South Africa? Whatever. You have to go into Africa. My geography is terrible. Uh, but uh, Cape, you know, Horn. Cape Horn. Cape Horn, sorry. Cape Horn. Good Hope is South America. Yes. Uh, which I don't know. It's called Good Hope because you hope you can get out. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah you, you, again, I'm trying to recall my ge geography lessons from school. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I mean that adds anywhere between ten to twenty more days, mm -hmm. which again eats more fuel, bad for the environment, adds to your price bottom line in terms of shipping goods uh, at the destination. Destination will have to pay more, and also, uh, you know, also labor costs and everything else. I know these ships are very much automated; you don't need a hundred people on, on on these giant uh, cargo and tankers. Uh, but you know that's not good either. Uh, not just consumers, but also bad for the environment. All factors to consider as we look ahead to the future. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, the only yeah. reason, you know, we haven't had skyrocketing, uh, skyrocketing fossil fuel prices on oil and natural gas is because the U.S. is pumping out so much gas and, and uh, oil. It's artificially uh, deflating the market to try to keep stabilization. So you may have noticed the gas prices at Quincy, you know, it's been fluctuating between 295 and about 315, depending on the gas station you're going to. And uh, it hasn't moved that much inside that zone uh, since probably the fall. Yeah, at least, yeah. Yeah, stays inside that 20 cent zone. We had gotten used to spikes as high as 70 cents, you know, in a four or five week period. Uh, not this, this is actually fairly stable. I know it's uh, more expensive than it was pre-COVID, but there's this fluctuation isn't, huge in terms of the fact that you know it's not like a dollar more in three months right right it's stayed inside this relatively safe zone inside quincy obviously if you leave quincy to like boston to have higher rents um the gas station has to charge more because they pay more rent um, significantly more in some of the stations yeah yeah that's why the prices are inact and and in and, and inconsistent it's not because of inaccuracy. It's because of the price of doing business, depending on the geographical location they're in. Um, and of course, cars are more efficient on gas than ever, and they continue to be more efficient. So there's uh, less gas stations, and there's also less fill-ups, which also impacts the cost of doing business for gas stations. Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, car efficiency is bad for gas stations. If you can believe that or not, but that's that's true. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, the, the Biden administration has you know pumped a crazy amount of uh, gas and oil into the into the global market, making us the biggest producer of that product. Which is why every time the Saudis cut a million barrels, the market doesn't move because we just we just pump so much in the system. And obviously, on a global level, in terms of you know geopolitical conflicts, we're hoping that it's going to be another warm winter in Europe. Uh, where, um, you know, that funky situation where Europe is still taking Russian gas, paying for their war, or part of the war, they kind of need the money to run their government, um, and, uh, you know, trying to wean themselves off at the same time, while also taking a lot of U.S., you know, natural gas to, you know, supplement them, which is actually more expensive than a pipeline from Russia. Natural gas from the U.S. is not cheap because of the transport costs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, if, you know, obviously, you know, if the winter is warm like it was last time, they, they, they won't be as dependent. Um, 
Honestly, it's bad and good because if it's a warm winter in Europe, it's not good for climate change, but you know, also reduces fossil consumption, which is kind of an ironic situation. Um, and uh, you know, as they kind of move away from Russian gas, you know, as this conflict continues in Ukraine, this 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 war of attrition at this point, um by both sides, um, you know, it's it's you know gonna impact you at home. But you know, if they don't need as much natural gas and oil. You know, the prices may continue to stabilize at a lower level uh, over time here this winter to spring. But again, a lot of things can happen. As I tell you today in January 18th, you know, you know, maybe something else bad happens somewhere else in the world. And, you know, we're going to feel it here. Um, the city brought back its uh, Martin Luther King Jr. breakfast uh, earlier this week. First time in three years. I know you were there, Techie. Yeah, uh, you know, it was good to see some folks again. Uh, uh, it was, uh, I'll be honest, I did mostly in and out. I came in, said hi, and got out. I was, I just had to get other stuff that day. <laughs> it was, as you guys, guys can kind of guess, I'm trying to juggle a lot of things here at home and, and also work. So um, so I'm not going to lie, it was kind of a hello and goodbye scenario, but I did stay for the whole breakfast. And um, Ian Kane, the new council president, did an incredible job. The speech was actually extraordinarily good. I was was very moved by his um, his uh, impact in his life on how mm. you know his message means to him and what it means to his life. And uh, it was it was incredibly well done. And again, kudos to the mayor's office in the city on uh, putting on an event. And honestly, thanks to you know Quincy High School and Principal Ford and and Superintendent Mulvey to host us there. And the Qu North Quincy ROTC was there. So you know, it was a, it was a, it was great to have it back. Um, it's one of the small ones in the area, uh, but it was good. Um, and also, since I said no crazy ROTC, they were there last night. The governor stayed at Commonwealth. Yeah, they posted the colors, which was nice. Very nice for those kids. They do a great job. They do incredible jobs. First time I've seen uh, no crazy ROTC come to the state house to do something like that uh, in the chamber. So you know, kudos to them. Great job uh, by the kids. Um, you know, I hope there's going to be more opportunities for them, you know, future ROTC classes to come uh, visit the state house and also post colors. Yeah, I've had an opportunity to interview several of, of um, them and they, you know, extremely well-spoken kids, um, but also very thoughtful, much more uh, mature beyond their age, for sure. So they, it's it's a great program. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I only got a brief moment to speak to them as the program was kind of on the move. Um, there's a lot of stuff that happens before we go on air. So there's a whole uh, several process of summoning the governor, alerting the governor, welcoming the Senate, getting people in their chairs. It's actually something that happens before the camera goes on. Right. Um, court officers lining people up, uh, lining up the ROTC. Um, and of course, they got a chance to meet Mayor Wu as, as she was coming through as well. So they had a chance to, to meet some folks, which was which is uh, very exciting for them. And I'm, I'm glad they had an opportunity to do that. But yeah, most people there's all this other stuff happening uh, before the camera goes on. It, it's like um, the um, the invitation is 630, but the governor doesn't speak to 7 o'clock. So we have to do all these procedural issues prior to the cameras going on. And then um, obviously there's a logistical issue to make sure, you know, make sure everyone's, you know, assigned seating, they're in assigned seating, including the governor's guests, mm -hmm. right? The governor's guests are have assigned seating too. So, you know, court officers, the governor's folks, you know, all these different people running around, um, you know, you never see it from your, right. but, you know, I, I have, I'm a participant in this different parts of the processes. It's a, yeah, a very formal procedure steeped in tradition as we do here in Massachusetts so well. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, again, you guys all know I appreciate uh, historical traditions like this. Um, it is uh, not quite timeless, but, you know, it does evolve a little. Um, but it's important. Um, you know, it's, it's always a little bit of a joke. You know, hey, you know, who's going to be available? How close are you to Boston to do the opening session? No one's going to see, you know, in the second half of the two year, right? <laughs> It's not like swearing in days. I talked about this earlier. Right. Swearing day, everybody knows because everybody's family's coming in. Big joyous, you know, for the new members, you know, and their family and their hard work to get to the state house. But I mean, when we do like, you know, the one in 24 to do the ceremony opening pursuant to constitution, you know, nobody cares. Pretty much. Yeah, it's, it's a year old hat by then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have to do it. It's constitutionally required. 
uh, again, these are, but still they're important. They're fun. Um, and in the part of Massachusetts history and, you know, these, these, um, these traditions, you know, are make you part of that history. Even, you know, maybe nobody's aware of it, but, you know, I did, I am. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's still very important. Um, we're at the end of the hour, believe it or not. Time flies when you're having tacky fun, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely does, Tacky. <laughs> uh, this is the point of the program where we tell folks how to get a hold of you. Sure. 617-722-2370. 617-722-2370 is the office. Uh, mash a button if you're not sure. Uh, but again, please be aware that this is uh, office is run by Jerry Paracella, the chair of economic development, which is why he's first on the auto prompt if no one's picking up the phone at that moment. So Wait to get to me on the, the list. Um, that's happened a few times. People hung up because it wasn't me first on the list. I don't control the suite. <laughs> You're just a tenant. <laughs> I am just a tenant for Jerry Perusella. Uh, <laughs> obviously, you can email me at tacky.chan at mahouse.gov, T-A-C-K-E-Y dot C-H-A-N at mahouse.gov. And my email box is flooding because Joint Route 10 is coming up on February 7th and the advocates have gone full steam ahead on advocating for their bills before Joint Route 10 reporting deadline. So I am now in massive sifting through mode. You can find me at State Representative Tacky Chan uh, Facebook. Uh, hopefully we'll have some pictures up soon uh, from uh, last night, as well as uh, X at Tacky Chan, the formerly known as Twitter. Uh, we'll try to post a few things there. And of course, we have tackychannon.org, which is our a more resource page and they got the ma legislature.gov which is the legislature's page you can look up a bill about me folks or see us if you want to see us in our various sessions and public hearings and see what the notices are up and you also can look up the general laws and past session laws and of course here at key ray tv or you know, youtube and your favorite podcast station you know if you prefer our face for radio definitely do the podcast not the youtube um, those of you watching us on QA TV cable access, well, I'm sorry, probably should go to the you go back to podcasts if you see us and you don't like what you're looking at. <laughs> and what you see is what you get, folks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No magic uh, here. <laughs> yeah, if you're watching on cable uh, cable TV or on, on YouTube and you're looking at us like, ugh, they're both a face for radio. Let's just stick with the podcast. Be my guest. <laughs> That's why we give people the option. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Tacky. Thank you, Joe. See you in a week.